my wife's birthday weekend. And so we're out celebrating and I, I found the perfect spot for the Wi-Fi here so, because I didn't want to miss this. And it's out actually on the terrace. So I get to look at not only the beautiful ocean, but your beautiful face. Um, so Excuse at me. the double win, whoa. And great <laughs> there we go. So don't, don't get too Basically complacent. Basically don't do what I just did. <laughs> if we wanted to spend a day on a roll, we'd be here for a year. It's, Let's it's not like, do that. No, no, we we have. There is another panel coming up at like seven o'clock, so we have to be done by then. Who is, is it? Like, Who is it? Who is it? Uh, for? It's Ryan Hurst, the Walking Dead, Bates Motel. Um, Never heard of him. Yeah, he's it, uh, a lovely fellow. Very tall. That and guy's beard is a poem. Yes, like every everything about him, and he's like an erudite. Like he's he's a he's a brilliant, wizened, gentle. He looks so unapproachable, but he's one of the nicest dudes. This is what I miss about going to conventions and stuff is like there's people like Ryan that I normally would bump into in the green room and be like, hey, man, I think your your work is great. And he's like, hey, man, who are you? And I'd be like, ah, it doesn't really matter. He's a guy that does <laughs> video games. Yeah, he's a, he's a lovely dude. Uh, like, kind of, It sounds almost like cliche, but like the gentle giant where it's like this big, imposing, physical dude who's just, you speak to him, it's like, oh, what a nice guy. But that's... What are you- yeah, that, that's in an hour. The, and for now, it is all about you. It's all about The Last of Us. And it could be, or like I said, there's just so much to talk about. I've, I had to write a list of here, just of the things you've been involved with. Obviously, the Joker and Arkham Knight uh, in well, the, the Arkham series with that, um, and the Telltale series, which is such an awesome uh, thing to play through as a big Batman nerd like myself. You've been involved in the Resident Evil property, uh, uh, Chartered, Metal Gear Solid, uh, Shadow of Mordor, Bioshock. There's just like this. Then there's the, the anime world with Dragon Ball Z, Bleach, uh, One Piece. Um, there's there's just like a gazillion things to not try and forget. Uh, Voice and Hawkeye, Loki, Hawkman, just Batman, Dick Grayson, uh, Jason Todd as Arkham Knight. It's like Tim Drake. Yeah, there's like tick, 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 tick. <sighs> and of course, Joel from The Last of Us. So um, that, like, that first game, dude, is... It's obviously the game itself is phenomenal and the sequel, um, but it's just like this emotional storytelling that's you're just watching the story. You're not really playing a video game, but you are at the same time. If that makes sense. But it's that that like I've never been gripped by a game as much as that like opening 10 minutes. It's like the proper lull you into a false sense of security of like, oh, it's cool. It's the dad's going to he's running off with the, the daughter. It's going to be all this happy ending and they're going to jump ahead to the future. And it's like, oh, right. That's a gut punch. Um, like how like how is this process to be involved in? It's just this like emotional roller coaster of a, of a video game. I love telling this story, man. It is, you know, we're, we're coming up on 10 years. And wow. yeah. to this day, it is still one of my favorite things to talk about. It's, it's, and not just to speak on, but actually have conversations with people about. Um, I, have, I, I have been involved in a lot. And uh, I've been fortunate to, that this has been my job for almost, 20 years. And through the course of that, I've done a lot of good stuff and a lot of bad stuff. Um, but each of those things has, has left some form of indelible mark on me. And the, my favorite part, especially like coming to conventions is yeah, meeting people like Ryan Hurst or whatever, but also it's, it's talking to people and finding out what mark has been left um, on them. And I never get tired of talking about this, um, but we walked into this game knowing that we didn't know what it was going to look like. We didn't know what it was going to, how long it was going to be. We didn't know how it was going to be received. We didn't know it was going to sell. But from the time that Neil and Bruce sat us down and walked us through beat by beat the story, Ashley and I both knew that what we were about to embark on was something that was going to forever change the conversation about video games. We knew that. And there was an immediately a, a, an imposing sense of responsibility that we had with this because we knew that we were going to participate in that conversation. And all we wanted to do is make sure that our part was in equal measure to what Neil and Bruce were going to give because we knew the pedigree that Naughty Dog had and we knew the games that they were capable of making. And we knew unless they just all decided to quit <laughs> that this game was going to be as good, if not better than the Uncharted series and everything else at the end of before. So I remember walking out to Ashley after we sat about for about, uh, like an hour and they said, here's the story. And they walked us through. And that scene, the opening scene, the prologue, that was baked in. I was like, this is how we're going to start our game. And this is where we're going to pick up. 
And it wasn't like, ooh, what if we did this flashback? They, they knew what they were doing. And there was some stuff that changed throughout the way and actually some stuff that was originally gonna be in part one that ended up becoming a part of part two um, and in different ways and, and characters that, that changed throughout the, the course of development um, for the better. But we walked out after an hour of hearing that pitch. And at the time I was still smoking and I, I walked outside to, to have a smoke and I looked at Ashley and I took a big drag off the cigarette and exhaled and I said, do you realize that if this thing sucks, it's because of us? <laughs> and she just kind of laughed and we both felt the same thing. It was a tremendous weight on our shoulders. And that's the, that, that burden became a mantle of responsibility that we have loved to bear for now almost 10 years. And it's, like I said, it's, I, I'm, I'm happy to be sat in front of you today to talk about this because I never, ever, ever get tired of talking about it. Yeah, and you kind of touched on it there. There is that huge pressure because of like the structure of the game. It's very much um, anchored on on the back of yourself. And actually, that's like the, those two characters are such the the bulk of of the narrative of the whole game. That if you guys didn't get it right, then that's it. Like you said, it's it's it could go off the rails a little bit. How was that pressure? Because like you said, you, by, by the sounds of it, obviously, it sounds like you thrived on the responsibility. But there, was there any moments where it's like, Jesus, man, this is this is this is heavy, heavy day. Every day. Uh, and of course, that really um, <laughs> exponentially increased when we were doing two. And mm -hmm. for a lot of reasons that really have nothing to do with um, it was a, it was a great lesson as an actor, because walking on a set um, for part two. Now there's a whole other new layer. Now you're a hit. Now you're you're the you're the reigning champ, you know, and you're now stepping into the ring. And people are like, can you still pull it off? Is it going to be better? Are you worse? Some people want to see you succeed and some people want to see you fail. And we walked in and every time I, I, I started questioning whether or not people are going to agree with this, there's a lot of things that we were going to do that we're going to put people's love of this franchise and these characters to the test, which is the point of the story. Um, otherwise, we're not doing anything interesting. But when you walk on and there is that pressure, I realized that 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 pressure belonged to me as an actor. It didn't belong to Joel as a character because Joel's not familiar, aware of um, the, the, the possible awards or the accolades. You know, he, he doesn't know what a Metacritic is, you know? So <laughs> <laughs> when, the, when I started thinking about, you know, oh, is this going to get us an 89 or an 85? Or is this going to be a 94? Then... I'm not listening to Joel. I'm not listening to Ellie. I'm not listening to Tommy. I'm not listening to Neil at that point. I'm, I'm in my own head. And so the exercise becomes, forget about what Troy thinks, forget about what we have to, in, in performance capture, you walk into this blank slate, this, this empty white room with all of these cameras mounted on the walls. And there's, you know, tape on the floor that, that signifies where different, parts of the set that you're pretending to walk around in and there's boxes that represent walls or a jeep and you've got you know the stupid suit on and there's a, there's a helmet on your head and the camera right here that all serves as props for you to believe you are who you are in the space that you are but in the same way i had to do that as as, as just an actor not only for the scene and for the character but I also have to be able to do that with all of the other trappings that come along with being a part of a successful franchise like The Last of Us. I have to not worry about someone writing about our process or someone writing about how we, you know, um, changed the characters and they didn't like it. Or um, we shouldn't have done a sequel to begin with. And, and thinking about what's, what the outcome is. If I only focus on the outcome, I'm not focusing on the end go. <laughs> I'm not yeah. focusing on what I'm putting in. And in that moment, none of those things exist. It's Schrodinger's cat. We could be a hit, we could be a failure, but it doesn't change the stakes that are in the moment. And, and it really forced me, or it gave me the opportunity to focus um, as an actor on just this moment. And that's, that's something that whether, you know, if anybody, regardless of the medium that you're fortunate enough to work in as an actor, you learn that lesson um, and that will serve you well because that is the, that's the gig. That's the gig. Yeah, I mean, th that first game went on to win so many, uh, like a stupid amount of end of year awards, uh, and rightly so. Um, and like the, the second one, again, the, the uh, response to that has been through the roof. But how was it when, because I believe it's like 1.3 million units were sold of the first game in, in a week. So you've 
from what I'm aware from the, doing some digging, the, the kind of the, the the initial idea, the gestation, I guess, period goes back to like 2009 for this game. So for them, for it to essentially take four years to come to fruition and be out in the public eye, the, how rewarding was that to then be like, obviously all the pressure you've had, all the, is this going to be, is this going to be a hit or not? And then you see that, wow, we've sold over a, whatever it was, 1.3, 1.4 million units in that initial week. And then to see the reviews come through as well. So it's not just selling, it's selling and it's being so well received. Yeah, man, I, I think it for me, um, and I, I'm, I think everyone's going to feel different, you know, Evan Wells or Christoph Balestra or Neil or Bruce or, you know, the, the powers that be at, at, at Naughty Dog at the time were obviously, they were looking at, we need to make sure that, um, this was a commercial success because yeah. otherwise we just waste a bunch of money. I have the privilege of being in a position to where, because I'm not tied to the financial success of that game, I just want to make sure that people, it hit people. And it was the reviews. It was the, and, and, and not just like the week after, you know, cause we got, re the, the early reviews came in. So review copies go out to, to the press and um, they play it. And then of course they're embargoed and they can only say so much, but every one of them was like, wow, 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 wow. And we started seeing those review scores come in at nine, nine, five, 10. And that's when we knew we had something, the sales will come in later. And for me, it's, it's been not just that initial week or that initial two weeks or month or year, but it's when people still at me on Twitter and they go, I just finally played this and I played it on PS3, yeah. um, you know, which they're, they're not even playing the, the, the most, there's so much that has changed in the amount of time since we've started making the game and put it out. Like when we originally did this, we didn't have the helmets with the face cams. This was all hand animated. Like they took reference of our faces and they would block this like they actually would a movie. So there's a reference camera that's following us for movement. Whereas the suit is actually capturing that data to be applied to the model. But then there's someone that's just tracking our face so that one animator can go in and go left eyebrow up. <laughs> it's, you know, frame 1,452 of scene 52B. That to me blew my mind. And, and we were able to halfway through Uncharted 4 go, we now have the technology to be able to um, put a face cam on you and track and give more detail. What that allowed us to do is be able to have a, a more one-to-one. -one. If Sam does a smirk, that camera is going to catch it. Yep. And so it really got us to, it, it elevated our performances because we, we now knew that those things would translate. So the, 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 the success of this for me is really, to get back to your question, the success of this has really been tied to how people have responded to this game. And one of my favorite stories, and I wish I would, could find this guy again, I think it was in Indiana. He said, um, he told me the story about how he had a daughter and he started playing The Last of Us and he got through the prologue and he goes, I got to the end and I stood up and I turned the TV off and I walked into my daughter's room and I held her and I cried. And he goes, wow. and I, I didn't play that game again. I said, no, I totally understand. He goes, no, you don't. He goes, because for six months, every day I walked past the TV and I saw that PlayStation not turned on since I turned it off from that scene. And it, it just bugged me every day. And he goes, and so I decided I'm going to sit down. I'm going to, no matter what, I'm going to get through it. And he said, and then I got to the draft scene. And he said, I put the controller down again. And I realized the lesson that I learned was, it may be hard, but no matter what, you have to keep going and eventually you will find your giraffe moment. And I'm like, there's no review. There's no sales report. There's nothing that can quantify that impact from a dad telling me what life lesson that taught him. And that's not something that I did or even Ashley did. It's something that 300 people at Naughty Dog did, hundreds of people at Sony did, every actor, every bit of crew, every QA tester, everybody that worked on that game funneled all of that into that moment so that one dad in Indiana could learn a life lesson that made him a better father. I don't know how you top that. You get best game by 
BAFTA? Sure. Or you sell a gajillion copies? Sure. That has the most value to me. Absolutely. Uh, it's, it's just the insane reach of this this series, this franchise, which it very much is now, because obviously there's, there, there was the sequel that came out last year. So it can finally, it is now officially a franchise. Um, and there's just with The Last of Us, there's so much love I can see in the chats here just about how many people um, who clearly adore this game because it is such a phenomenal piece of work from everyone involved. If if you do have any questions as well, throw them in the chat and I will get to those shortly. That's why I keep looking this way. Um, but I guess with with you get you get a response like that where there's this uh this dad in indiana that has this this extremely personal moment with yourself with the game how then because it's it is it's it's rare to say, and it's some might think it's it's hyperbolic to say but it really isn't it is a perfect game it's that it's like the perfect game so yeah. then it, it, when there's that kind of right we, we should do a sequel to this, but is there that kind of, I guess, trepidation of like, yeah, but that other one was so good. Like it yeah, was the, bro. It was, you're following up something perfect. It's like, man, that's a, a tough ask. Look, the for me, it was either we make Godfather 2 or we make <laughs> Independence Day 2. You know, oh, do geez, we man. take something that was so perfect <laughs> and so indicative of a time and do we further that storytelling? And we, you know, flush out these characters even more and show you sides. You're like, oh, I see the evolution. Or do you go, that movie took something from me and it retroactively makes this one buy. Like, I can't go back. And I loved Independence Day. And I can't watch the first one now because the second one was that bad. <laughs> it was like farting in the elevator of that movie. And now it just all stinks. I, sure, sure, there's that fear. That's Troy's fear. And what I realized is that there was still more to the story that needed to be told. It compelled us to tell that story. And if it didn't, if, if, if there was no more of the story, then we would have stopped. Very early on when, uh, as a musician, I had a, uh, someone that I really looked up to that was a musician and, and a great songwriter. And he's, I was like, how do you, he's just cranking out songs and the songs that he wrote just really lyrically melodically really spoke to me resonated with me and i was like how do you do it man he said when the song starts i start and when the song stops i stop i respect the song and for me it's there's a lot of times we've seen this in film tv games music books there's a point where especially commercial success can replace that original compunction to tell the story yeah. and it's like yeah, but dude, if you do another one, I mean, that made a billion dollars. Come on. And who doesn't want to do that? Yeah, we'll, we'll crank out with some. We'll, we'll hand hock the story in there somehow. But the, 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 the discipline and the respect of the story to go, if there's a story to be told, we'll tell it. And if there's not, then we won't. That is transcendent and is unilateral. That's why I remember asking Neil, like when we were originally talking about doing the movie, I was like, dude, why do you want to do the movie? This story has been told. We shot it. We lit it. We scored it. Everything. Yep. It's done. And he said, because at the end of the day, there is somebody out there that's never going to pick up a controller and play this game. And I believe the story of Joel and Ellie is important enough to bring it to them. And that's why I instantly changed my perspective on what was then the movie and now even better, the series. Because you can't tell this story in two hours. But no. You can tell it in 20, 30, 40 hours. So I, I look at that and I go, I want someone to experience the, the same moment that that father in Indiana had. I want someone in Wales to have, in Budapest to have, in New York to have, in Texas, wherever it is. I feel it's important enough to bring this story to people. And if that means that you watch it on a screen, you'll experience a version of the story. That's why they're changing. And there's things that are about yeah. it that are different. Um, but for me, I always want to make sure that if the story is going to continue, if the story is compelling us to move forward, I damn well better be ready to jump on board. Yeah. And I think as well with the, obviously with the, uh, I guess, 
how long term storytelling has been done in TV for the last probably the last decade or so is it's just it's completely changed the game in being allowing such stories like this to kind of be told in rather than just a two hour movie you get you get I don't know a couple of seasons of like twenty three episode um, seasons of of TV sort of thing with the the budgets being afforded to to TV shows now the the um, how important things are viewed some people viewing TV is more important medium than the movies. Um, and allowing more opportunity for, for um, I guess, people to have their creative input um, or output even. But I don't know with with this whether, I don't know, whether to go into, spo- if it's classed as spoiler territory or not, because The Last of Us 2, some people may not have played it yet or they may not have got through certain elements of it. Sure. Um, but for, for yourself, when you uh, when you agreed to come back to for The Last of Us 2, uh, part two, yeah. when did you kind of, when was the story broken down to yourself and what was your reaction to it? Two in a non-spoilery moments. kind of way, sure, I guess. Sure. <laughs> yeah, two different moments. One is, um, it was after the BAFTAs, we were in London, and there was, there's the, the, the cocktail party that happens afterwards where it's one of my favorite events. Um, I love what BAFTA means to games, does to support games, both inside the industry and pulling people outside the industry into it. They have one of the best programs for uh, young developers. Um, tremendous organization. Um, they they have the, the, the great party. It's two of the nines. Everyone is, you know, it's black tie. And uh, afterwards, you either commiserate or you celebrate, depending upon whether you won or you lost. But either way, it's still a celebration of the industry as a whole. And so there's the cocktail reception and everyone just gets twisty there. And then we leave from where we used to be at the tobacco dock and now we move out into, you know, dodgier spots in, in East London, especially we find a bar and we, you know, further celebrate or further commiserate. And we were staying out in the parking lot. I think we were waiting for an Uber and Neil just decides to tell me, then he goes, so I think I have a story. And I went, go, what do you got? And he kind of walks me through the beats. Then I was like, okay. Yeah, I immediately it hit me that this is the way that the story needed to go and the direction that it needed to be taken in. Yep. And then I think it was maybe a year, year and a half later, um, I'm sat in his home and on his couch in his office. And he goes, I'm going to walk you through the story. And we did that for about an hour, hour and a half. And at first I was taking notes. And by the end of it, I was in tears. And I was like, it's perfect. It's perfect. Um, I hate it and I love it. And it was almost akin to the same moment of when we walked out on um, the first time hearing the pitch and I was like, we're about to make something that's going to change the conversation forever. I had no idea the context that that conversation would be had. Um, And you talk about how television has changed in the last decade and how now, you know, before it was, it was the movie house. It was the cinema that, that people would escape to. And now people don't want to escape. They want to be, they want to immerse themselves into it. It's no longer escapism. It's immersion. It's, it's no longer a snack. It's a meal. It's binging. And that has shaped the way that we tell stories. I've been watching West Wing, um, which first aired 20 years ago. And the way that structurally writers write for TV has completely changed because yeah. you had to give act breaks because you were going to commercial. You don't have that anymore. So the 22 minute or the 44 minute has changed. And now it's how long does your episode need to be? I mean, as long as the budget can, you can shoot within the budget for the show, it could be an hour, hour and six, 52 minutes, 58. doesn't matter. We don't have any commercials um, unless you haven't paid for the subscription on Hulu. And that's a different conversation, but it's, it's that notion of, the, the, the world changes and it's, uh, it's incumbent upon us as creatives to adapt or die, that this is how we evolve. And there is inevitably going to be people that resist that change, but they only resist that change until they realize that there's benefit to them. And once they find the benefit, once I find the benefit to a change, I will embrace it. But until I do, I will resist it. So anybody that was uh, resistant to the change in this story or to where this medium is going, I think needs to look deeper under the hood and find where the benefit is. And once they will, once they do that, I believe that they will embrace it. Love it. Uh, Very philosophical. I I, I could listen to those tales all day. Um, I guess this would be as good a time as any to drop in a little nugget here that I've just looked at the the chat and there's, 
Well, there's lots of people commenting about they hope that one day Troy comes to Wales Comic Con. Uh, so I guess now will be as good a time as ever. Do you want to break the big news? I I have been wanting, look, I have one part of the UK left on my like tick the box that I've been, been able to come in Wales is the holdout. Um, and so I have been, uh, th- this has been my like my unicorn that I've wanted to have for so long. Uh, and so fortunately I was able to have a conversation with Jamie earlier and I was like, listen, dude, what do I got to do? And he's like, you just did it. So yes, I'm very, very excited to say that this November I will be joining you guys live um, I'm glad that the world is starting to uh, find a path forward so that we can have these kind of events live and in person. It's something that I've been very much looking forward to. Oh, you, you're back. Go. You're back. Yeah, you, you totally froze then for all of that. It was like this massive, um, uh, just like a cliffhanger of like, yeah, I've always wanted to come to Wales. It's the one part I've, and then it just like, you froze. Oh, like, no. no. So I do, I, I, what I just said was perfect. <laughs> All right. I know. I imagine um, it was. What, what's the cliff notes on this? So the cliff notes is absolutely. I will be joining you guys live in November, and I cannot wait. I cannot wait. Uh, matter Amazing. of fact, I've got that tattooed on my wrist. Can't wait uh, <laughs> to see you guys live. I'm grateful that you know we've finally been able to through vaccines. We've been able to find a path forward, um, and uh, I want to. I want to be there in front of you and be able to tick that box. So yes, I will be joining you guys live in November. Amazing. Uh, that is, uh, that's official. It is November the 20th and November the 21st. Uh, Wales Comic Con, uh, Telford Takeover. Troy will be in the, in the his house, I guess, as the kids would say. Yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, there's, and there's plenty of questions coming in here. Uh, but I, what something you just touched on before about the changes in TV, for example, but you also sure. talked about the changes you had in, uh, well, in, I guess, in your, your line of work over the years. How's that been to now be like doing the mocap work from from doing the, the voice work before to now? Okay, it's voice and I've got a load of balls stuck on me. And, and like you said, you've got a camera stuck in your face and it's all very much like, right, okay, you do this side of it as well. It's something that I originally was drawn to. Like when I first started off in this, it was traditional voice over work. Um my first game was a game uh, called Brothers in Arms, and I, I played the, the main character, and, and I had no experience. Um, I, I was a singer, so I knew the business end of a mic, but beyond that, it was I, I had no idea what I was doing. I had played games, but at, at that point, there wasn't a whole lot of narrative. We had like, um, you know, we had Silent Hill and Resident Evil and stuff like that, but it, it wasn't anything like it is now. Um, but I knew what they wanted to do was tell a story and I was familiar with band of brothers. And so I knew that they were trying to bring that kind of storytelling into a game and actually get you to be able to play the battle of the bulge, which I thought was great. So, um, I started off with that. And then as things progressed, it was when I was doing this really, really bad movie, uh, in my home state of Texas, where a friend of mine gave me his, his just released PS3 to kind of, uh, keep me company on set. Um, I played Uncharted and Assassin's Creed. And I was like, wait a minute, <laughs> when did this happen? When did people start? And I found out from my friend, he was like, for Uncharted, if they had a Jeep, they built a Jeep. And wow. these people actually, they shot this and I went, it blew my mind. And I ended up emailing the audio director, uh, Phil Kovats at Naughty Dog. And I was like, just want to let you guys know, you did a tremendous job. Um, and I didn't ask for a job or anything. I had no idea years later of course i would be working for them but that became the thing i was like i want to do that whatever those people did like that's that's immersive that's in a, in a in a medium that i love that i understand um and i can be anybody like it's the 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 thing that voiceover had taught me is the characters that i had played i had played 70 year old sages and i had played 15 year old adult boys it didn't matter i could be anything and that was the job that best matched my imagination what I'd, t- what I'd found out from TV and film was that my eye collar was wrong or my height was just a few inches off or I wasn't thin enough or I wasn't you know, fit enough, whatever. So I love the freedom that, that games and animation had shown me. And so once we started, my first mocap job was actually one in uh, Japan for a game that ended up getting canceled. So, I mean, talk about, it was great boot camp for me to learn the, mm-hmm. the, ins and outs and the pros and the cons of it. Um, I would end up shooting in Japan twice, as a matter of fact. Um, and then being able to all of a sudden find myself on, we did Resident Evil 6 
And this progression of like performance capture is becoming like a standard. You better, you better know what this is all about. And then we're shooting the last of us and then we're doing uncharted and then we're doing, you know, all of these games became a part of their pipeline and their process. And I've watched how, how much it's changed and iterated. It is my favorite because I'm able to interact with my fellow actors. I'm able to, someone actually explained it or asked me the same question. It's like, what's the difference between doing like just VO or, um, uh, performance capture. And I said, it's, it's a commerce of tools and trust. Whereas if they give me fewer tools, I'm giving them more trust. If all I have to, to convey this character and my performance is a microphone, then I am entrusting my performance to them to animate it to the intention of what I wanted or trust that if they do something different, they have a bigger perspective on it than I do. And it's going to fit. You take something like Dota. Dota was because of we, we hit pretty much in the pandemic. Um, that was all done in isolation. I think we had two sessions where I was with another actor, but by and large, I was by myself. A lot of it was done in my home studio. So there's a lot of trust that I placed with Ashley Miller and our, our animation team, uh, Netflix for that series. Um, yeah. Proof is in the pudding. It works out great. But when someone says, we're going to give you a performance capture stage, we're going to give you fellow actors, we're going to build sets for you. That's a helicopter. Wow. I thought it was some like giant bird or something. Oh, where it's coming from. That is literally a helicopter. Wow. Yeah, my, my view is not quite as good cool. here. There's, there's, there's a wrestling cool, belt cool. there, and that's it. <laughs> not not that's, quite uh, as good. That's cool. the Coast Guard, is what that is. <laughs> um, then they're giving me more tools, and they're giving me more trust. They're saying, we want to make sure that your movement is best in line with what this character is. And, and that, to me, I, I, I love thinking about it in those terms because it keeps me on the same side of the table as them. Yeah, um, and to uh, to get to fan questions, is that the line up here? There's Grognarok eighty eight uh, is asking, uh, "Will you be releasing another song like Breathe, uh, collaborating with people around the world?" Yes, I would love to do that. So, if you don't know, um, last year about this time, um, we when I say we, I, I sat down. It was right when we had gone into lockdown in the states, and um, I wasn't feeling particularly inspired. I was feeling actually a little bit more, it rained for like two weeks straight in, in California, which is it's, you know common for the UK, but it's not common for, for the California especially. And the, the reality of the situation had set in, and I have a tendency to feel um, a claustrophobic. And uh, when I do, it's, I just need to breathe. And so I sat down at my piano that's in my studio and I, I looked out the window and the sun was just starting to come out. And I was like, the reality is, is that the sun is always there behind the clouds. We just can't see it, but it doesn't change the fact that it's there. And what I need to do is just breathe. And so I, I, in 15 minutes, this song just like, boom, came to me. And it was just a piano and a vocal. And I sent it to my dear friend and amazing producer, Wayne Miller. And I was like, hey, man, I have this song. What, what can we do? Is there any other way we can make this cooler? And he goes, let me circle the troops. Let me call them up and we see what we can't do. John Titterington, our keys player, was in Oregon. Uh, James Bowen, our guitarist, was, I think, in L.A. at the time. But we were all dispersed and we were all in isolation. And long story short, that song in about two weeks had circled the globe. And along its trajectory had picked up almost a hundred people that all contributed to this song and everybody recorded in isolation. And it's one of the best songs I feel I've ever written. It's one of my most favorite collaborations that I've ever done because all of these people that I've, uh, especially the people in our community that we've gotten to know, um, I felt like I gave them something to participate with. And I, I feel like a lot of people like, I really needed this. Um, and there was, a, there was a, 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 a similar project that Eric Whitaker did with a virtual choir. And I wanted to do something, if you haven't looked it up YouTube, but it's amazing. Um, he was able to get 300 people, then a thousand people, then 5,000 people, I think. Um, I was like, I wanna do that. And I believe in community. I believe in connecting. And I believe that something creative is the best way to do that. Um, 
so I was grateful to be able to give some people uh, uh, an opportunity to do something, but it's on Spotify. Um, if, if you guys want to check it out, it's um, when I do a musical collaboration with these specific people, uh, our name, uh, our band name is window to the Abbey, A B B E Y. And if you look under Spotify, you'll see breathe is up there. Um, if you ever feel down, it's, it's a great song. So yes, long answer. Uh, I want to do something like that again. And, and fortunately through this whole pandemic, it's, it's, I have found that at the very, very beginning, someone came to me and very offhandedly said, uh, well, the Renaissance followed the plague. And that to me is, is very apropos. It's incumbent, again, it's incumbent upon us as creatives that when we are in the middle of the darkness, that we have to find the light and we must drag the rest of the world with us into that light. And we do so through us telling our stories. We do that through our music. We do that through our writing. We do that through our games. We do that through our content that we create, whether it be on TikTok, Twitch, YouTube, Instagram, it doesn't matter. We have to tell our stories and we have to share that story with other people. If you ride alone in the darkness and do it, that's benefiting you, which is great. But understand that if you feel that way, somebody else does too. And they need to know that somebody else feels that way too, that they're not alone, that they're I wasn't alone feeling claustrophobic during the pandemic. Other people coming to me saying, I felt the exact same way. Thank you. That's what we do as creatives. So do I want to do another one of those? Seven days a week and twice on Christmas. Absolutely, I want to do it. What, what a brilliant answer. I feel like this is, if we were in like a live setting now, there'd be like just a mass, a mass stand ovation for just a, a fantastic answer. I would answer love that. that. Yeah, it's just, I think- We'll that, test that theory in November. <laughs> we will, yeah. I, I, it is. It's, I think you hit the nail on the head there. It's a case of, um, like you said, almost like sharing your story with the rest of the world because other people are going through those same sort of things, having those same sort of emotions and those same sort of feelings, especially the, the last year we've had. Um, so, yeah, that's just an uh, awesome sentiment to, to live by. Um, there's a, a question here from Eloise. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Elo. Wheeze, as in like mm. sneeze, cough. Um, how did it feel to shoot something as wholesome uh, as the museum scene in uh, in The Last of Us Two? We all knew that there were there were two scenes that were coming. Um, one was going to be a dark moment, and one was going to be a light moment. Um, and for me, the museum sequence, because they're so interstitial. Um, there's one big scene, but the rest of it is so interactive, which is the purpose of that is so that you can, the more that you, the more that you're on the stick, as I say, um, I feel the more immersed you are into the experience. And so when the camera comes up and takes over, a lot of times there can be a barrier for people. So the design of that scene of being able to move around the museum and interact and touch stuff and talk to Joel and play the hat game on the dinosaur, all of that we knew but for me, it was it was the um, it's the base, the spaceship scene essentially. Um, it was the it was the shuttle scene, um, the lunar module uh, landing landing module. Um, that was the one that we all knew. Like conceptually, we had read the page. We knew what the scene was going to be. Um, we spent a lot of time on that scene, and, and for me, the me I've never had a relationship with a game in the way that I did with Last of Us Part Two ever across the board run the gamut and that scene specifically um, first of all where it falls in the game I just I, I didn't realize how I just I just stood there for a while I'm trying to make, not, not spoil things mm -hmm. but I, I took a lot of time uh, in that in that scene uh, or that that whole space, as a matter of fact. Um, but I knew what was coming and I just wanted to savor every moment. And I've never felt more connected to a character than I did in that moment because that's a, the exact way that Joel feels. I wanna, I've set this up. I want to savor every moment um, because I know it won't last long. And as an actor, I knew that as a, as a player, I had the peek behind the curtain because I was a part of making it. And then there's also Joel and just as a dad too, I know what that feels like to 
traveler, this was his first birthday, just turned three. It was his first birthday to understand these presents are for me because of this day. And even Christmas and stuff really didn't resonate that way. It was kind of a big deal. Like it took us all day to open our Christmas presents, even though there was not that many um, because he just, I just want to open one at a time. This is a lot. It was very wow. overwhelming. And this was the year he's like, I got it. So to see him tear open that present and look at it and understand that's for him. I understand that moment. And I've never, I've never felt that way about a scene, about a character, about a game than I did. And that extends throughout the entire game because I've never felt the way that I did when I was playing as Ali, when I was playing as Abby, um, where I was in conflict with the game, where I felt hungry, where I felt tired, where I felt thirsty. Um, to me, that is one of the greatest accomplishments that that game has is the, it makes you feel what the characters feel. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, a, a question here from uh, Hannah, Hannah Marie. I'm going to pronounce it like that. That could be wrong. Apologies if it is. Honey Hannah. Uh, yeah. Um, and just asking Troy, would you like to see Ellie and Abby's stories continue or would you like to see something completely different? Yes, to both. Um, I, I feel that, first of all, as a studio, Naughty Dog, Neil especially, um, is, a, is a brilliant storyteller. Yeah. Um, I, I have, I'm truly humbled by his ability to tell stories. And not only that, but also the studio behind him that he stands shoulder to shoulder with, everybody that's there, you can say whatever you want. That is the top of the game. Like the, what, what, the people that are working there um, and really, I mean, I, this is not a disparagement against Microsoft Studios. I just have more experience working with Sony Studios. Same thing goes with Insomniac, Sucker Punch. Look what Sucker Punch pulled off with Ghost of Tsushima. Yeah. It, is, it is incredible. The, and all of these games were made in the middle of a unprecedented pandemic. And the fact that they were able to ship that game and not a bit, apparently, of any of the, of the, of the caliber of game sacrificed one iota. That is a, that's a miracle. Um, but I think that they're not done. I, I think that there's the ability to, you could tell this story in, to infinitum uh, with Abby or with Ellie. I believe that there was a beautiful culmination at the end of that that tells that story. I think that revenge um, has a very short wick. And once you light that fuse, um, you better get there quick. Uh, I, I, so that's why I believe that it's not so much about a story about revenge as much as it is a story of identity and a story of obsession. And to me, obsession, you can continue to tell. I mean, that, that, that has played out through Breaking Bad, Batman. You can talk about yep. this, the, the story of obsession. Um, but I also want to see something new come from Naughty Dog. I want to see, you know, they, they shook up the world when they said, hey, we're the pulpy, you know, popcorn video game company and we're going to tell this Cormac McCarthy Coen Brothers movie <laughs> in a game um, that's a dark, you know, zombie thriller. And I would love to see where could they go next? They could yeah. literally, what do you do? I mean, do you tell a period piece? Do you do sci-fi? What do you do? Um, so my answer to you, Tiny Anna, is I want to see both. I, I, I think that you could continue to tell this story. I think that HBO will be a great platform for them to tell both more about Ellie's future and her past if they choose to, but I also want to see what other games Naughty Dog can crank out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have this comment as well say, uh, he just calls me that because I'm apparently that much tinier than Troy. So I'm, uh, you've got less. Um, this is, I, I've got like, there's so many questions and I'm looking at the, the clock. We've got like 10 minutes to the next panel. So unfortunately, I think we're going to have to make this one the last one. And it's, it's sure. a, a, a one, um, it's one non Last of Us question to end on, um, and it's from DJ Flash Harrison. He's got a few questions in the chat. Was uh, was asking that what was the difference basically between the Telltale Batman and the Lego Batman? Because obviously you have uh, you voiced yeah. both. They're both very. Um, as someone that's played both both versions of that character, uh, the Lego version obviously is a little um, softer, a little bit lighter, a bit more uh, excitable. And then you've got the very serious um, noirish uh, Telltale series, which is brilliant uh, piece of story time again but yeah what was the, the differences like between those two versions of the dark knight the king crusader the world's so, greatest detective uh, lego was fun because um we were we were all brought in it was it was laura bailey travis willingham um that we we got the band together for that and we were 
they're like, this is the first time we're going to give Batman a voice. And so we recorded, it was late at night. I think we started at seven o'clock in the evening, which is weird. Normally you would do like nine o'clock in the morning. We're starting at seven o'clock. We're going to end at like 11 o'clock. And it felt like someone had left the studio open and we just got in there and just decided to, to make a thing. The problem is, is that they, we were going to do a game, but the game lampoons a movie. Like you have Star Wars, you have Raiders or Indiana Jones. And so they're like, oh, we have to make a movie. So we ended up making the movie and the game at the same time. They put out the movie and then they put out the game. Um, using basically the same cinematics with a, a few things. We thought that was it, one and done. And the next thing you know, it sells like gangbusters. People are like, of course we want Lego Batman. It was such a huge success before, just <laughs> um, So they decided to crank out all of these movies and they just kept calling me. I expected them to go to Diedrich Bader, Kevin Conroy, and they're like, no, yeah. I actually really like what you did. Because what I was able to do, I got to pull in some Adam West. I got to pull in some Michael Keaton. I got to pull in some Christian Bale. I got to pull in some Kevin Conroy. I got to pull in some Dietrich Bader. I got to do all of them. And Lego Batman is the culmination of the greats. Um, it's a buffet of Batman. Um, and every time they, they give me a call to be able to do that, I will answer that call. Um, for Telltale Batman, it was very much the spiritual successor to me to BTAS, Batman the Animated Series. Yes. Uh, Nick Herman and Pierre Chorette were the brilliant writers um, behind that. Um, and then Eric Sturpey, who came on, who's now uh, with Fortnite. Um, th those are the people that were like, hey, this is our print. This is where we want to go forward with this. Uh, Mary Kinney was also involved in that. She's an insomniac. So the writers of that were inspired by that. And so for me, it was like, I'm really going to lean into my Kevin Conroy because to me, that is my Batman. Will always yes. be my Batman. Yes, and that is nothing against Christian Bale, uh, Patrick, uh, whatever his name is, you know, nobody. It's just for me, Kevin Conroy is the best Batman and the best um, Bruce Wayne, which is the main thing that people can't get right. And he just nails it out of the gate. Uh, if you haven't played Telltale, I think you can still get it on Steam maybe or something. It's, it's somewhere, yeah. but um, or hopefully Telltale has, has kind of revitalized themselves. It's a brilliant story. What they do with the characters, Laura Bailey crushes it, of course, as Catwoman. Um, it's, a, it's a truly, truly phenomenal story, and it gives you the opportunity um, to choose which version of Batman you want to be. Bruce Wayne is just as much of a hero uh, or protagonist as, as Batman is. Yeah. Um, yeah. That I could go on and on and on about this. I, I look forward to being able to dive deeper into these conversations and others, uh, maybe play some music <laughs> when yeah. we're there in, in Wales and finally be able to tick that box. But um, I'm very grateful not only to have this conversation with you, but also be able to hopefully in some way raise money for um, a mind charity. Um, so that's something that has been proven to be needed in this in this crazy time. So thank you. I really appreciate you having me today. Absolutely. No, no. Fa thank you, Troy, for uh, giving up all this time to come and talk to us. Like, like you said there, it's like this this chat could go on until like tomorrow morning uh, and I'd be yeah. more than happy. Um, unfortunately, we uh, time is against us we, because there is another panel coming up in approximately seven minutes, which will give me time, just enough to get a coffee refill, I believe. Um, but that'll Perfect. be Ryan Hurst uh, from uh, The Walking Dead and Base Motel from Sons of Anarchy, uh, from Saving Private Ryan, from Saved by the Bell, the new class I discovered uh, a couple of days ago so uh, that's coming up in a few minutes thank you to everybody who's tuned in on the, on the stream for this uh, and who's put out questions sorry if we didn't quite get a chance to get to all the questions but um thank you very much and yeah troy thank you so much again sir and we look forward to seeing you november the 20th and the 21st here in uh well in, in telford for a uh, tougher takeover wales comic-con i look forward to it man see you guys then Reckon. awesome